I'm Scott Rass, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I've trained law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created a bodylanguagemembership.com with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, helping people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I help people and companies radically transform their abilities to read and influence human behavior. And I also wrote the number one best-selling book on the subject. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together this number one bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott Rouse. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street or corporate America. All right. We want to give you a little short. We get we get a lot of uh, input from the panelists, and panelists are people who subscribe to our channel. And yeah, so subscribe. Like, if you haven't already subscribed, do that now. Yeah, so go ahead and subscribe. So we got a lot of, of input for Alec Baldwin and the situation he's in right now. Greg, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so this is around the accidental shooting of someone on the movie set of Rust. And this particular video happens to be he is vacationing, I think it's in Vermont. And he car, cars are following him and his wife, Hilaria, and their children. And so they pull over and they do an impromptu press conference, if you will. That's what we have. Mm -hmm. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to play this one time, and then we're each going to tell you what we see in this. This should be fairly short. Should be. We'll see what happens. We can be long-winded, right. so yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. I will. What do you want to know? All right, Ali, what's the current state of what's going on with the case? I'm not allowed to make any comments because it's an ongoing investigation. I've been ordered by the Sheriff's Department in Santa Fe. I can't answer any questions about the investigation. I can't. Okay. It's an active investigation in terms of a woman died. She was my friend. She was my friend. The day I arrived in Santa Fe to start shooting, I took her to dinner with Joel, the director. We were a very, very, excuse me, we were a very, very, you know, well-oiled crew shooting a film together, and then this horrible event happened. Now, I've been told multiple times don't make any comments about the ongoing investigation and i can't i can't i can't that's uh, it and you met with, what are the sorry what are the questions that you have other than that you met with the uh the the, the um I'm afraid I forget her name in the moment, but you met with her family uh, in the Helena. day. Yes, her I name met is with her Helena. If you're spending this much time waiting for us, you, you should don't know, know her, her name. name. Her name is Helena. Helena Hutchins. I met with her husband, Matthew, and her son. Yeah, that's right. And uh, how did that meeting go? Uh, I wouldn't know how to characterize it. They're, 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 they're you, mortified. You guys, they're you guys, you know what? You, I mean, no details. But, but do, do me a favor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the question. Well, I appreciate that he was probably very upset. The, 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 the guy is overwhelmed with grief. This is something that, that you know, there are incidental accidents uh, uh, on film sets uh, from time to time, but nothing like this. This is a one in a trillion episode. It's a one in a trillion event. And so the, he is in shock. He has a nine-year-old son. You know, we are, you know, in constant contact with him because we're very worried about his family and his, his kid. And uh, as I said, we're, we're, we're eagerly awaiting for the sheriff's department to tell us what their investigation has yielded. What else do you have? Would you ever work on another film set that involves uh, firearms of that nature? I couldn't answer that question. I, I really don't have any, I have no sense of that at all. I do know that an ongoing effort to limit the use of firearms in, on film sets is something I'm extremely interested in. Yeah, I'm aware of you. But remember something that I think is important, and that is how many bullets have been fired in films and TV shows in the last seven to five years? This is America. Millions. How many bullets have gone off in movies, firearms, and on film sets is something I'm extremely interested in. Yeah, I'm aware of you. But remember something that I think is important, and that is how many bullets have been fired in films and TV shows in the last seven to five years? This is America. Millions. How many bullets have gone off in movies and on TV sets before? How many billions in the last 75 years? And nearly all of it without incident. So what has to happen now is we have to realize that when it does go wrong, and it's this horrible catastrophic thing, some new measures have to take place. Rubber guns, plastic guns, no live, no real armaments on set. That's not for me to decide. It's urgent. It's urgent that you understand I'm not an expert in this field. So whatever other people decide is the best way to go in terms of protecting people's safety on film sets, I'm all in favor of, and I will cooperate that, with that in any way that I can. Do you have any further projects in the works at the moment, or is everything on hold? No, no, that, that's right irrelevant now? to what we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. Right. 
Do you think production will start up again on No, that? I doubt it necessarily. Was there anything else? Why Vermont, Alex? Is because yeah, that's we a just that, no, 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 that's a person. That's part. Yeah, that's part. Anything else? Okay. okay. So just do me a favor. You don't mind. My kids are in the car crying. Because you guys are following. And all I want to do, as a courtesy to you, I came to talk to. You. I'm not allowed to comment on the investigation. I talk to the cops every day. I talk to them every day to find out. They know where you are. Of course, look, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I'm of cooperating course. with them. Of course. So my point is, is that. Is it? I'm just asking. We sat down as a courtesy now to talk to you. Now, please, would you just not follow us for the rest of this? Just, just leave us just alone. Just go home. We gave go you everything home. we could possibly give you, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Condolences. Thank, Thank you. you. Now turn it off. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yes, I'll try to be brief. This is nothing funny about this situation because, you know, somebody's dead. We don't want to joke and laugh about that along the way. But there are pieces of this that are almost comedy. Uh, my favorite is the... What are you doing up staging me moved by Alec Baldwin more than one time it was she steps excuse me we were a very very excuse me no I I, I believe the excuse me is don't upstage me this is an actor and somebody walking in front of him on the camera very excuse me but there are a couple of things that I think you can see are going on here my assumption based on what I see is that yes they've been followed by these reporters and yes they're getting frustrated and I'll bet there's a bunch of going on in the car right now over that very thing look what we've gotten into and they're bickering and going back and forth because you can sense some stress between the two of them as they get out you can't miss it you see the body language of them he comes out and the first thing he does is he's almost like he's going to go at them he calls them out let's go, let's go. I will let's go and you know that is a if you know Alec Baldwin's past, he's punched a couple of folks and done some stuff like that, allegedly. Another day, another Alec Baldwin meltdown, just one day after using a gay slur when cursing out a photographer. Yeah, the actor sets his sights on a local TV reporter who apparently once had a run-in with Baldwin's wife. So my opinion is they got this thing going on, there's some BS going on in their vehicle, then he stands square on. Men don't typically square off with other men unless there's a threat and unless we're trying to pose a threat. If you don't believe that, tomorrow go stand square on with another male and watch what happens. One of you will turn to obliques. I've walked people down the hallway doing that before. It's funny to watch. It's just a great experiment for you. He's animated his chins up. He sounds like a seasoned actor delivering his lines. I'm not allowed to make any comments because it's an ongoing investigation. I've been ordered by the sheriff's department in Santa Fe. I can't answer any questions about the investigation. I can't. Because what we do is what we do, what made us successful. So he blasts out information very well, but his respiration's up. He leans in on my friend to emphasize that point, which makes me believe him. She was my friend. She was my friend. Then she upstages him and he, you know, he calls her out, excuse me. Very, excuse me. Pushes her away. And when he gets to what else, he does the same thing. She starts to get step up there. I see her wanting to be included and to tell off the reporters is what I see. And then he um, he makes her leave. He makes her uh, then leave her alone. Makes her move out of the way. You see her set jaw, her clamped lips, her head thrown back, the down drawn sides of her mouth. That's anger. And then I have to finish with this. Is that a Spanish accent at the very end of this when she says, "Go home, turn off your camera." Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, so I, I agree. Um, they they literally take their mark at the start. Of, the mark is the little cross on the on the ground uh, where you stand because you know you're going to be in the right place for the camera. And so yes, I think some of it is 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 it, his push away of of uh, is it is it Hilar Hilaria Hilar something? Her birth name isn't even Hilaria. It's all American, Hillary. But anyway, um, I think part of the push away is is number one. You know, don't crowd my lines and don't crowd my my space. I've got this handled. There's this sense of I'm I'm the act. I'm the star. I've got this one handled. Um, I, t but he. he he edges forward when he scores points, um, and we get a little bit of mouth grooming as he feels he's scored a point and he gets more confident, he'll come further towards the camera. I agree, we see anger in, in her, some real bottom teeth acting, uh, action from her. Uh, he does a point score on the, on the um, journalist not knowing the name of the, of the victim of the deceased. And we see him do this, this smile, this side of the head, 
and a full chin job. Helena, yes, her name is Helena. Helena. If you're spending this much time waiting for us, you, you should don't know, know her, her name. name. Her name is Helena. Incidental accidents, we get a touch of the nose. Now that could be his nose is dripping a bit, might be a bit cold out there, but it's it's out of out of baseline for him. So I think he he realizes incidental accidents is an odd term to use. One in a trillion, one in a trillion. Well, that's hyperbole. That's exaggeration. You don't have the stats on this at all. So, so think about the kind of person who might do a lot of hyperbole, a lot of exaggeration. Uh, I can't, I don't know how to answer that question, he says. And we see disgust there um because it's a really good bind question from from the journalist of do you think you'd ever you know work with guns again it's like oh, i'm i'm about to put myself out of most every piece of filming that's ever done in america and he does like hoist the flag at the end he goes this how many bullets A good point on there. The journalist can't come in and go, yeah, well, forget about it. This is America. Who, you know, who, who, uh, who cares uh, about that? He can't, he can't not raise the flag on that. Um, what I love about this is that we see uh, the female edge round the camera on, on Baldwin when he says, um, but remember, but remember, I think that's a trigger for her in that he's going to hold forth. He's now took the stage. He's going to say something brilliant. She forgets that what she's meant to be recording is the journalist as evidence of their harassment. And round comes the camera on, oh, look, you know, Baldwin's going to do a great part of the act right now. And then suddenly she realizes, oh, no, I'm not meant to be meant to be doing that right now. Um, yeah, that's what I got on that one. Chase, what do you got? Is this the one that had the big news scandal with a fake Spanish accent or something like that? That's her. Ilaria Baldwin says she's quitting social media after facing major embarrassment over accusations of having faked her Spanish accent and heritage for years and years. Listen to her charming Spanish accent here. Married life is really nice. You know, it feels different. But the accent is gone in this video she just so, posted. There's been some questions about where I'm born. I'm born in Boston. And then I spent some of my childhood in Boston, some of my childhood in Spain. But her biography on her agency's website states Baldwin was born in Mallorca, Spain. In this video, during a cooking segment, she can't remember the English word for cucumber. We have, um... Cucumber? Cucumber. Okay. Don't know what her name is. It's all American Hillary. You see some lip compression right when he's talking about meeting with Helena's husband and son. And that typically means or denotes that someone's withholding opinions or withholding some information, which would be par for the course here. That's probably holding back some information. I think Alec turns to face... Hilaria. It's all American Hillary. Alec turns to face her with shoulders and feet pointed at her, which I think indicates a little aggression, territory and intent. And I think there's a possibility that it might not be don't steal the spotlight, but don't embarrass me uh, because he has a clear narrative that he's trying to do. And she's clearly doing the opposite of what he's trying to do and, and be friendly and show some candor. Uh, he has a nine-year-old son. He's no longer mentioning her name as the mother. Uh, and he says his family, his kid doesn't mention their names, which could be for privacy or could be to protect some of their privacy. But typically when we see someone fail to mention the name of people in stories, it, it tends to be a red flag. But this may be a, a different case. And I think, I think he's it's, got six of them. What's that? Six little kids. Five yeah. or six little kids in the car. So, yeah. Oh, what, what he's what I'm talking about is the the film producer's right. uh, yeah. husband and and child. And I think it was interesting that that Alex' wife or partner tries to answer for him, and he just shuts her down. And I think it was uh, interesting that he does not want anything to to really come out of her mouth at all. We were a very very excuse me. 
And she continues to try to interrupt and answer for him. Like, are you going to be involved with this, any movie in the future with guns in it? And she says, oh, no, he's not. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, maybe so. <laughs> and I think it's just an unusual illustration of maybe how that relationship works. But there's another stop gesture. And if, if you're not familiar with a stop gesture, that's when we're trying to convince somebody not to do something or we want somebody to stop. Our fingers will extend all the way out and, and we'll kind of do this during the conversation. But even if your hand's down at your side or in your pocket, your, your hand will extend out if you're trying to get someone not to do something. So we see that right at the moment. He says, my kids are in the car crying, which I think is absolutely honest. But I think it's unusual that he's eagerly awaiting this report from the sheriff when he's the one with all the information. He has more information than the sheriff does, most likely, about what happened. And I'm, I'm wondering, he, he said, we're eagerly awaiting all this stuff, wondering what, what he's waiting on. And if he says he's not an expert in this, so he doesn't want to comment on it, uh, that would lead me to believe that he must be an expert in everything else that he tends to, to comment on in the media, or he must think he's an expert in those things. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Oh, yeah, Scott, great. what do you got? Okay. Sorry. All right. Well, he opens up with, um, what do you want to know? I will. What do you want to know? And the first question they start asking about, he says, I can't, I cannot talk about comment on what happened. I'm not allowed to make any comments. I think we're seeing him separate himself as far away from, as possible from responsibility for this. This is something that, that you know, there are incidental accidents uh, on film sets uh, from time to time. Because, man, this is going to be a huge lawsuit. The Santa Fe District Attorney now saying that criminal charges may be filed in the Alec Baldwin prop gun shooting that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. We're seeing everything that shows he's he's in a panic and he's worried. It's almost like somebody's jumped out of the car and said, all right, man, let's now, like he's going to fight him. He's going to fight somebody because he's in panic mode. His, his respiration is up. He's talking really loud. He's looking back and forth. His eyes are wide and they're all baggy. You can tell he hadn't slept a whole lot. He's tired, I'm sure. And then he's got his wife out there running around with a camera. And he's telling her, excuse me. Excuse me. When she gets close to him. Wow. Excuse me. And when he starts talking about the an act, he can't talk about an active investigation. I think he's 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 doesn't want to talk about how much trouble he's in. I'm not allowed to make any comments or any hint of that any of this is his fault at all, which it may not be. This is a one in a trillion episode. It's a one in a trillion. Episode. And I think he's a producer on this as well. So so maybe there's some responsibility that lies with that. I don't know how all those things work in that in that business. He says it's urgent. You know, I'm not an expert in this field when he's talking about guns. It's urgent. It's urgent that you understand I'm not an expert in this field. So his goal here, I think, is to get out that he doesn't, he doesn't know anything about this man. He was just an actor there, and was somebody told him everything was cool, and then he ended up shooting the gun. Would you ever work on another film set that involves uh, firearms of that nature? I couldn't answer that question. I, I really don't have any, I have no sense of it at all. This is the behavior you see in somebody, when you jump, if somebody jumps out of the car and says, man, we're, we're gonna do this. You see that the person who's probably going to get their hand in whipped, that's what they look like. If Greg and I were to get, if I say, okay, Greg, let's do this, man, he wouldn't look like that. He would look like, wait a minute, Greg thinks something funny. <laughs> there, he'd look like that. I said, all right, man, let's do this, dude. It's it. That's what he'd look like, you know? But this guy doesn't look like that because he's afraid. He, he's, he looks like he's going to be attacked, and he's afraid he's going to be attacked by questions or the questioning, I think, at this point. Today we're going to talk about Alec Baldwin and the interrogation interview that happened right after the shooting that happened on the uh, Russ set. Greg, you want to tell us about the video we're going to watch? Yeah, so this just came out this week. It was immediately after the, the shooting. We're not going to call it whatever, whatever you want to call it, you call it. This is an interrogation regardless of what you call it because there are two police officers asking questions. They read him his rights. You can call that whatever you want. And what we're going to see is he doesn't yet know that Helena has died. He is simply talking up and answering questions about the incident. Do you think that any part of this incident that occurred was intentional? Oh, I, I can only say this, which is, and, and it was to me, to place a bullet and position a bullet that is a live round to make sure that that bullet is in the chamber. If I were to squeeze the trigger in a rehearsal that that bullet came out, 
someone has to have extraordinary access to that weaponry to do that. I can't imagine somebody walked around with a round that was a 45 caliber round. So you see other people on the set were speculating that if it was a 45 caliber round, she'd be dead. It would have blown a big hole in her. And so we're wondering, was the projectile that went in her, some foreign material stuck, and it was an accident, it was a flash round, and something came out of the barrel. They didn't check. They always check. But... But to your experience with these armor... I've never heard of anything like this in my life, ever. Okay. I've never heard of a projectile coming out of a prop gun that went through a person's body, in regards to her being a smaller woman. The, the, the bullet went in here, I'm told, went in here, came out here, her shoulder or whatever, and went into his body and buried it. I've never heard of that in my life. I don't know of any projectile with a gun in a flash prop gun that could accomplish that. Now, if somebody put a live round in there accidentally, see, a very important question for Hannah is, do you, have you ever commingled live rounds with theatrical rounds in your kit? Because they're forbidden to do that. Mm -hmm. According to, the, I think, the union rules and the safety rules for all the unions, you're not allowed to do that because of the fear of what will happen that you commingle. So whether someone accidentally, and I can't even imagine this, deliberately placed a live round in that gun, uh, I mean, I've never, never heard of that in my life. And I, I don't know anything about what happened, but all I know is when I... See, see, the other thing about this is, in a live round, you'd have a recoil, usually. When I shot that gun and it went off, I didn't shoot it when it went off, um, I didn't intend for it to, 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 to for what happened to happen. When that happened is, it, it, I'm always told, but because I'm not a gun person, I don't have a gun. They've always told me, they asked me to simulate the recoil. When I shoot the Colt, which is a big gun, 45 caliber bullet, they always teach me when we should be go action. I go, get back here, boom, and they make me take my hand and go, boom, and have the kick. Because mm -hmm. there's no kick in a flash round. Okay. And when I, this time, I don't recall there being any kick either. That's important. Okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is about three minutes of him saying the same thing he says in a later video that we've all put together. What I will say is pay real close attention to his body language. He's open when he starts. He doesn't yet know that she has died. It's clear. His body language is open. He's punctuating everything he says. His illustrators are very strongly narrating his story. To use your term, Chase, he's using body narration. He holds up his fingers about the size of a 45 long colt round. His body language punctuates what he's thinking. When he is unsure or he is training and teaching, he has long vowels, if you listen, to me, but he doesn't do that when he's telling you the story about what actually happened. So his head, his hands, his language, everything is unified and congruent as he delivers a message about what happened. He says, to me, and then the only place you start to see anything, even when he says a live round, he narrates with his hands very closely. The only place he goes into that long vowel is when he starts to teach. And when he teaches, he uses a batoning move because he's telling you something you don't know. The union forbids it, and his, his vowels are longer there. At the shot, he corrects himself. He says, when I shot the gun, and then he corrects himself. And if he were trying to get away with something, in my opinion, he would start with, I didn't shoot. The gun went off. But he makes a mistake, and he corrects it because he's trying to clear it up. And then he says, I don't recall recoil. That's his speech pattern, New York speech pattern. I don't recall. That kind of thing, my wife may say, I don't recall, New Yorker. I think here, I see more of what we did in a longer video that you should go and spend some real time on, but I don't see anything anything out of the ordinary red flag. Scott, what about you? All right, I, I agree with you. His, his, he's really open. His body language is like, he's just wide open. The, the classic, what everyone thinks is open body language or says is, this is it. Everybody knows what that is. Uh, he looks fairly, his voice tone is low. His cadence is just kind of loping along. He doesn't seem distressed as I would think he would be or as I would be in that situation. But obviously he doesn't know that she's died yet or that it was a real bullet or anything. So he doesn't have all the information yet. And, and that changes. We, if, we, if we juxtapose this, um, behavior and his tone and his cadence and his diction to that interview you did with Stephanopoulos, the one with Steph Stephanopoulos, it's changed there from this. The story hasn't, but his approach to it has, to his description of it. And Stephanopoulos, of course, it's a big deal. He's on camera and all that. He's on camera here, but he's not thinking about it because it's up in the corner. They're everywhere. So in that Stephanopoulos one, it's, his diction is perfect. His, his tone is, is a little bit higher, actually, than it is here. 
but again, he doesn't know how bad the problem is yet, or that the that there's such a um, grand problem, such a big deal uh, going to happen here. Um, but back to this video, yeah, he is, uh, <clears throat> he's stressed, but you can tell he's had an adrenaline dump. From all this stuff that's happened, he's almost relaxed. He's he's sort of worn out at this point. We've seen him using, I agree with you, with you Greg, those, his, his, these demonstrative gestures, as we call them. They're, they're on point. His illustrators are on point, and they're where they should be. You know, every time he's, he describes something, he's very demonstrative again, like Johnny Depp when he got that bottle thrown at him that we've looked at. He's, he plays everything out. He shows you everything as he goes through this. Um, let's see what else is good here. There's so there's so much to talk about, but he. But what I thought was good too is he lets him know it's got to be. He knows there's a very special situation that has to happen to get a real bullet in a gun and have somebody shoot it in that situation. It has to go through so many steps. I don't think it would be. I I, I don't see any deceptive anything on him at this point. I, I see nothing. I don't see him guarding. I don't see him, you know, bobbing and weaving. I don't see any chaff and redirect. I don't hear anything odd. Everything seems to me the way it should be. Everything is as it should be. So zero indications of deception, nothing weird or make me go, ah, oh, he's really thinking something different. Nothing like that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to agree, and I'll just tell you how and why I agree. Uh, look, the question is, is can you think of any reason why somebody might have, you know, kind of done it on purpose, I think, as a, they're kind of saying. Um, he says, I can only say, but before that, he goes, we, so he, he, he collides two words together, which I think is um, who and why. Who and why. So I think already his mind is is curious about a perpetrator, okay? Curious about a perpetrator. Now, that's not to say he's going, who will have done this on purpose? But he's trying to work out what are the set of circumstances and people may be involved in a supply chain that may well cause this to happen. I don't think he has a perpetrator in mind. He does mention... Um, uh, the person in command of the of, of the armaments uh, later on, I think through, throughout that, and say, look, there's a specific question you need to ask around that. But he's being helpful, he's being really helpful about this, and not and not chaffing and redirecting the help somewhere. He's genuinely look. He's focused. He's focused on on the interviewer. He's not focused on both of them. So he's not doing, uh, you know, what what Chase often calls kind of looking at the threat, working out where is the threat. He's not looking to exits. He's not looking through the glass window to go, what are they thinking sitting behind that glass window? You know, he's very, very clearly involved, forward, focused in taking people through the story, his body narration, what I would just say is, is his mime. His mime of the stuff is really good. It's, it's the same each time. It's the same as he mimes stuff later on. So I can't see that he's, he's making up stories here to fit. Just as everybody said, the batons, the illustrators are congruent. They come uh, at the right time and they're the right kind of uh, movements there. Um, his head is nodding in acceptance throughout. I mean, go and look at it. See if you can find any head shakes at all. He's he's forward in acceptance of the situation. I think if he felt under threat at this point, we would see uh, more shaking of head from him as he wants to get out of this situation. Um, I would just say there is potentially one um, adapter. Yeah, there's just one adapter where his hand goes up to his nose here. Now, look, touching your nose doesn't mean anybody's lying. Okay, just so you know this. Yeah. And this only happens once. So I am really giving just a very strong opinion here. I'm playing the casino here. But because I see this once and at the point of she'd be dead, blown a big hole in her, I'm going to say, and this is a bit of reverse engineering, that that there is a worry and a tension that she may well be very badly injured. He doesn't quite know at this point how bad the injury would be. And maybe somewhere in his mind, he does suspect there is the possibility that it is a bad, bad injury and death is 
an option. Okay, And I'm only saying that because it only happens once. It's incongruent with everybody else. There is no reason to touch the nose at this point. And I'm going to say it again. Just because somebody touches their nose doesn't mean they're deceptive, doesn't mean they're lying. I'm only saying that because of the huge context that this is in. But this is, from my point of view, clean as a whistle. I say the same as everybody else is saying, it's very different from when the circumstances then changes to there's now a death. There's now a real, a massive catastrophe. Now the press is on him. Now the, the eyes of the world are on him and his behavior starts to change around that. Chase, can you change our mind about any of that or, or are you with us on that? I'm with all of you guys. And let me add a couple things. Um, uh, you guys took about half of my list here, so which is fantastic, <laughs> which we should be doing. We should be agreeing on a lot of things. It helps people to understand that this stuff is pretty reliable. Uh, let's talk about a couple of things you guys uh, didn't. He's comfortable doing something that interrogators call processing potentials. In a lot of criminal interrogations, you'll see, why do you think this happened? Who do you think did it? Did you talk about it to your friends? Did you tell your family about this? So he is extremely comfortable, and it's evident that he's processed every possible thing that could have happened when a guilty person would just say, I don't know. I don't know what happened. You know, it was a mistake. It was an accident. He's trying to process potentials. And he's basically following the, just the little guidance on the back of your insurance card. Don't admit guilt and don't say you're extremely sorry about something because he's not doing that. And it's probably from a cell phone call to his attorney, which is was not mean guilty. It just probably means intelligent. And his attorneys told him not to do that. And which is why that most people have a problem with him starting his phrase with, I can just say that's probably from the attorney. Uh, so the reason he's sitting in this interrogation room without an attorney is because of something we call the assumptive assistance fallacy. And this is how Columbo solved crimes. This is how he tricked the people into thinking that they were helping out with the crime. This is likely how he was brought into the room. And he's also coming in to help. He is genuinely there to help. He's saying, here's what you should be asking Hannah. Right at the end, he said, the gun didn't kick. That's important. And he wants them to know that this is going to help in the investigation. So there's some assistance going on. And right when he said it, he also says if it was a 45 full round, she would be dead, which I think suggests he is not completely sure about the gun. And he is probably hopeful about his friend actually being alive. There's one moment in here he puts his hand on his chest and it's when he, when, it, when he says, I'm not a gun person. I think there's a little, uh, little display of some virtue maybe going on or him just displaying some innocence. I, I don't own guns. He's been shooting them in movies for 30 years. Uh, so he probably knows more than even a lot of gun people. But most importantly here, most importantly, in, in my opinion, he uses great body narration. You see him narrating the story. He uses a lot of it, but he uses the exact same body narration when he is comfortably saying that someone deliberately put a round into the gun. He comfortably illustrates a deliberate putting into the gun, putting a bullet into the gun. That, I think, in any person's mind who felt that they were at least partially guilty, that would be restricted. If that behavior existed at all, they'd probably mute themselves for that physically. But if, it, if he tried to do that behavior, it would look different and it would look severely restricted compared to all of his other ones. So and he shows no hesitation during that deliberately putting in the, the bullet in the chamber movement. That's all I got on this. Do you think that any part of this incident that occurred was intentional? Well, I, I can only say this, which is, and, and it was to me, to place a bullet and position a bullet that is a live round to make sure that that bullet is in the chamber. If I were to squeeze the trigger in a rehearsal that that bullet came out, someone has to have extraordinary access to that weaponry to do that. I can't imagine somebody walked around with a round that was a 45 caliber round. So you see other people on the set were speculating that if it was a 45 caliber round, she'd be dead. It would have blown a big hole in her. And so we're wondering, was the projectile that went in her, some foreign material stuck, and it was an accident, it was a flash round, and something came out of the barrel. They didn't check. They always check. But... But to your experience with these armor... I've never heard of anything like this in my life, ever. Okay. 
I've never heard of a projectile coming out of a prop gun that went through a person's body, and regardless of her being a smaller woman, that the, the bullet went in here, I'm told, went in here, came out here, her shoulder or whatever, and went into his body and buried it. I've never heard of that in my life. I don't know of any projectile in a gun in a flash prop gun that could accomplish that. Now, if somebody put a live round in there accidentally, see, a very important question for Hannah is, do, have you ever commingled live rounds with theatrical rounds in your kit? Because they're forbidden to do that. Mm -hmm. According to, the, I think, the union rules and the safety rules for all the unions, you're not allowed to do that because of the fear of what will happen that you commingle. So whether someone accidentally, and I can't even imagine this, deliberately placed a live round in that gun, uh, I mean, I've never, never heard of that in my life, and I, I don't know anything about what happened, but all I know is when I... See, see, the other thing about this is, in a live round, you'd have a recoil, mm -hmm. usually. When I shot that gun and it went off, I didn't shoot it when it went off. Um, I didn't intend for it to, 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 to for what happened to happen. When that happened is, it, it, I'm always told, but because I'm not a gun person, I don't have a gun. They always tell me, they asked me to simulate the recoil. When I shoot the Colt, which is a big gun, 45 caliber bullet, they always teach me when we should be go action. I go, get back here, boom, and they make me take my hand and go, boom, and have the kick. Because mm -hmm. there's no kick in a flash round. Okay. And when I this time, I don't recall there being any kick either. That's important. Okay. All right, now let's throw it around the room and wrap it up in 30 seconds or less and, and tell what we think is uh, going on here or what's happened. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, look, if you have any suspicion about Baldwin and that he might have some kind of, um, I guess, conscious invo or even unconscious involvement in putting a putting a, a round, a live round in a gun and firing it on purpose, um, you know, think again, <laughs> think again. Uh, I, I would say based on what we've seen here, there's nothing going on for him. Uh, around this, take your eyes off him. The investigation. If you're if you're investigating this in in your mind, you'd want to be investigating completely elsewhere. Chase, I'll just say one thing here. It's easy for a lot of us to see experts on YouTube who don't have a whole lot of experience, but they've read some books, they've taken a few courses. Uh, I just want you to just process the fact that before you say, "Oh, he's an actor; he can trick everyone on planet Earth." Everyone that's on your YouTube screen right now has surpassed the 10,000, 20,000, and 30,000 hour marks in interviewing people a very long time ago. And uh, many of us have specifically interrogated people that were very well trained to resist interrogation, to fake stuff, and do a lot of intelligence training. So the actor thing is, is, is a great, uh, if you just want to dismiss it, but a lot of us can see through that stuff, especially with actors. And Actors are humans too, and we are special. We specialize in looking at humans, so that's what we're seeing there. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, I would back you up. I mean, I taught interrogation resistance, and I taught people tools to use, and those tools come out. It's just human nature. He's not doing any of that. We don't see any resistance. Yeah, can he act and can he do something? Sure, but it's not the same thing. I would take you a couple of steps. We're going to hear everybody say, "But he had his finger on the trigger." We saw it. Remember, we just covered Johnny Depp, who got his finger cut off and couldn't remember details after. It is normal after a catastrophe for your brain to focus on the problem, not what happened leading into it. So a lot of times people will not have the details. That's one of the things we look for. We also notice that his story doesn't fundamentally change between here and Stephanopoulos. Scott, you pointed it out. Does his stress level rise? Sure. He now knows someone's dead. He's now been stalked. We saw him on the roadside. So yes, of course, his body language changed because his stress levels are different, not higher, different. They're probably very high right here. But I think, Mark, you hit it dead on. If you're looking at him and thinking he went and put around, you're chasing the wrong dog. Scott, your turn. Yeah, I agree with you guys. And how many times have you been in, you've been uh, in a training class and, and you're, you're training or teaching somebody says, how do you interrogate? What do you do if you have to interrogate an interrogator? Don't they know all the things you're trying to do and all that? You can keep it up for a little while. You can act for a little while. But after a while, in between those little sections, that's when you get all your info. And pretty much after a while, it just goes away. You know, you can act like it, even though we know a lot of stuff. If we got interrogated, it's different. It comes, it, it, yeah. it hits you different. It comes, they knowledge. know you know that. Do the I? knowledge I is not the unity. Yeah. yeah. Guys, yeah. I went through SEER and I'm an interrogator and, you know, <laughs> their stuff worked on me. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you trained them how to do that, too, and would still work. So as you go through that, people say, you're, you're right, when it says, oh, he's an actor, he can do, he can act like that. <laughs> no, they can't. They could can do it in front of a camera, and nobody's giving them any pressure. When there's pressure on you, it's different. It's a different situation. Now, back to this video, I think there's going to be a, a lot of, of fallout from this as far as responsibility goes, obviously. And I think it's going to go partially to him because he was a producer on this. You know, and he was the guy that pulled the trigger. So we'll see what happens there. But when you get a situation, but I've been looking into this and seeing what, what people were saying that were there and all that. Apparently the crew was sleeping in the cars, their food was nasty, and they they weren't respecting them. Nobody felt good about what was going on. There was like this general feeling of malaise in the whole thing. Nobody, nobody was motivated. They're almost disgruntled. So when you have that going on, no respect for it, that's when you, and you start hiring the least expensive people to help you do this stuff. Not in her case, the, 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 the woman that got shot, but a lot of, I think for the crew, the crew and the way you treat them that way, I think you're going to have uninterest. And I think that's what happened. So I think most of it's going to go back to, and it's just my opinion, my personal opinion. I think that armor is going to get it. I think it's all going to go back to her. Because that's the person the most responsible. Everyone is responsible. It went down that chain, but it's a chain of responsibility that had so many, every link was broken in it, obviously, or that wouldn't have happened. That wouldn't have happened, I don't think. But that's just my opinion. So I'm pounding error. You know, Scott, let me just yeah. say something about that memory piece, because, you know, okay. people might still go, look, you know, why can't he remember what happened with that, that gun? And to your point, Greg, I want everybody to think about adrenaline, okay? And when a disaster, a gun goes off and it's going to make a different sound, although he doesn't, it says that he didn't feel any different, it's going to make a different sound. People are going to start screaming. There's going to be blood. His adrenaline is going to spike. Adrenaline does a whole bunch of stuff. And just Google it and you will find out what it does to the body and to the brain. But one of the things it does to the brain is it wipes short-term memory. That's why if you do any kind of public speaking, okay, and you've learned your, you've learned your presentation and you know it and you know it and you know it, and the moment you walk on and you see more than five people who you don't know, which to the brain is lots of strangers, adrenaline will spike and everything that you try to remember about that presentation <laughs> disappears completely. Because because under stress and pressure, your brain, your fight and flight system goes, well, what would I need to know about the last few minutes? I need now to get out of this situation alive. And I imagine, Greg, that's exactly what happened to him. Adrenaline spikes, short-term memory gets blown out, and he now doesn't really know what happened in those moments beforehand. Yeah, yeah, use this or not, guys, but I'll tell you, the reason we train people the way we did at SEER is we take them out of thinking brain and put them in reactive brain, and we train that brain. Because when you get in that situation, you can't access all of the intelligence you have. But you can respond to things that you've been trained to do. So Chase, your, your Walmart bag and all those things came from there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so to that point, Greg, when I'm training people for public speaking, for doing a speech, I stress test them. I spike yep. their adrenaline, you know, in the practice situation. I have all kinds of, of nasty ways to do it uh, and unpleasant ways to do it. But I spike their adrenaline so they get that sense of, wow, that's what it's like under real stress and pressure to deliver this. Without that, they're, they're going out untrained. Yeah. Perfect. Well, all right, fellas, I think this was a good one, and uh, I'll see you next time. Have fun. The Behavior Panel. All right, Chase, good luck with your thing today, man. Yeah, Chase. Coming. Yeah, Chase. Oh, no, shitty. For, oh, you're fucking with nah, us. No, 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 I'm not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, you got me, man. I can see I'm the shadow. Well. I can see the shadow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, you got me good. Today we're going to talk about Alec Baldwin. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to see. Yeah, these videos are from an interview with George Stephanopoulos about the Rust shooting where a cinematographer was killed and the director injured. That's all you need to know. The Ukrainian-born cinematographer quickly gelled with Baldwin. The people who watched The Daily said that her work was beautiful. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. But 
admired by everybody who um, who worked with her. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, so first off, let's just look at how this whole thing is set up. It's advertised as Baldwin unscripted. So clearly that's a piece of PR, I would say, in that they're, our worry is, hey, this is all going to be scripted, isn't it? We want to really hear this, hear the truth of this. And they've kind of seen us off at the past there by going, no, 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 this is totally unscripted in order to um, countermeasure any worries we might have about this. So that that obviously worries me in the first place about this. Um, now that it's that it may be unscripted doesn't mean that it's not designed and it's not uh, structured. And so we're going to see that the interviewer there has um, has notes. Uh, my guess is, is they've structured out these questions. It's not blasé as to how this is going out. There is going to be some preparation, more than some preparation involved in this. Uh, the lighting there, we can see that Baldwin is very, you know, uh, there is a shadow side. Just so happens that the shadow side, the dark side is his gun shooting side as we will his dominant hand as we'll see later on I, you know these things can be accidental but in really good production it's really often not very accidental that that's the way things are set up so already potentially yeah unscripted but by no means unstructured or undesigned in any way let's have a look at the the rhetorical process that he uses there or structure that he uses there loved by everyone liked by everyone and admired that that rule of three piece is actually beautifully structured not necessarily written but could be scripted i mean beautifully put together and that um admired area that's the moment that um pushes him into an emotion now i guess the the worry from people is 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 that emotion real is it true here's what worries me about it is the shading of the face could be shame could be shame there's a lot of good reasons why it could be shame but what i've noticed about people who are overcome by emotion is they they forget to protect themselves from everybody seeing it feels to me like he wants to protect people from seeing that now is that because of the shame of people seeing the emotion or is it that it's not quite good enough he doesn't think his performance of that is good enough i'm not sure i'd like to hear from everybody else as to what they think about this but i tell you it it doesn't ring quite right uh for me greg what do you got about this one yes i'm gonna start by saying when we talk about scripted i think most of this is unscripted by that i mean i don't think he had lines prepared for everything he had areas that he's willing to talk about those things that he's uncomfortable talking about where he's been coached and i'll point those out because they're pretty easy to see you can tell that somebody said stay away from this and you'll see it late in the videos but here i do see i do see a little grief muscle in him and whether that's acting I, you know, I'm not a great Alec Baldwin fan. I know people love him. People hate him. I'm kind of, you know, lukewarm, don't really care. A couple of movies he's done, I like, and that kind of thing. I've never thought of him as, you know, he's not Anthony Hopkins. So I don't expect him to be a perfect actor. And in fact, if he's doing this, I'm impressed. I'm actually more impressed than I recall him being as an actor because his grief muscle does engage, although lightly. And him putting his hand up could be face blocking because of shame or that mark. We won't really know. I mean, certainly he feels, you can tell he feels something about this woman as he's starting to talk about her. It does look like it overtakes him rather than something that he's prepared. I don't see him what I call going down the well. Of course, he is a real actor or not the people we usually see trying to act and lie who find a way to draw themselves down into a well to start crying but so it it kind of overwhelms him it looks like so i think it looks real enough to me considering i don't typically think of him as that fantastic an actor mark you may have a different opinion but it's his normal speech pattern that sales pitch that he always has when he's talking where he goes up at the end down when he's telling you but up at the end and when he says she was what word does he use? Admired. Admired. Mm -hmm. That word is a sell. That is a big sell. That is a, hey, here's who she is. I also don't see, and the reason I don't think this is really prepared and scripted, I don't see a whole lot of left eye accessing. I see him talking and thinking, and we'll see him as he talks storytelling in a way that he does as a person. If you've seen him on like late night interviews, when he's storytelling and talking about something, he 
Chase, you call it body narration. He uses his whole body to tell the story, and we're going to see a lot of it. He's using illustrators. His cadence is pretty consistent and that kind of thing. And his cadence even changes when he goes down into this kind of emotional feel. So uh, that's what I got. This early in, I'd say, yeah, okay. I, could he be acting? Sure. But if he is, it's probably better than most of his work in the past, in my opinion. Chase, what do you got? So I have an acting friend who is on uh, a bunch of soap operas, uh, like Young and the Restless specifically. And he is one of the stars of Young and the Restless. I called him. We know him. We know him. To figure this out. Yeah. You guys have met him. And I talked to a, a few other people. And one of the tricks that I've heard from several people today that is used is peppermint extract to make somebody cry. And I think it's interesting in this clip, the eyes, the upper eyelid goes from normal color to completely red in just about no time. And this is an unusual response for anybody crying. And I think all of us here have talked to people who are in the worst day of their life. And there's only marks I think this is interesting. There's only marks on the spots where his hand was touching his face. And I think the instantaneous sniffing uh, was not long, in my opinion, not long enough for tears to form. It's more likely to be an irritant or something that like a peppermint extract that might have cleared the sinuses. And in this video, there's some grief muscle, but there's a lacking movement right here which if you ever see somebody in grief or shame, this little chin, it's called the chin boss, this movement kind of moving up right there uh, is, is missing for this video. And finally, the side of his nose that his hand was touching, which is his left side of his nose was red just as well as his eyelids were red. I think that's interesting. I'm not saying that it, that it absolutely happened, but I think that it's, it's definitely something worth looking into and it's something worth considering for the video, especially since it's such a pervasive uh, technique that uh, f from what I've heard today. Now, Scott, what do you think? All right. Yeah, I agree with you. Did that all, for, so did you watch the, did you do frame by frame for the chin? <clears throat> no. Chase? No, okay. Because no. he does get some dimples in there, but man, that comes on pretty quick. The, the whole crying thing hits him pretty fast. I agree with you there. We see a lot of heavy head illustrators. We're dealing with an actor, so most everything is dramatic. Um, his, head, his head tilts just a little bit when he's trying to say, you know, or tell something serious. His head gets a tilt on it when he says when he starts talking about something that he's trying to to point home to validate that statement. Um, there, there are no tears. A lot of sniffling, but there aren't any tears. And I think the forehead movement and the grief muscle, the reason we're seeing just a little tiny bit, I call it tactical Botox because he really doesn't look like he's been Botox, but man, he has because that happened, you can tell they have been when their eyebrows start dumping down there in the middle. They start like pointing down almost like the evil, whatever it is. And if you look at his eyebrows, I think this is one on his left goes up and is almost pointing up at, at you know, looking for Sputnik 1 or something. So it, it, he's got that, that, what I call a crash right there in the middle of those heading down. So we do see a little bit, but I, there's not enough there to be able to tell if it's a, if it's true grief or not because it didn't come up with that upside down horseshoe thing. But I agree with you, Greg. It's there, but it's very small. And what's in the in the chin boss is minimal, minimal. Even frame by frame, you have to go through and watch. It's minimal, but that thing passes by so fast. It you know I'm sure he may have been holding that up and then boom it got away from him. But that was mighty quick to to be a, a full on emotional cry in my opinion anyway. Other than that, everything looks looks normal and as it should in this situation. All right. You know, I, the thing I, I find interesting about grief muscle is it can be so different in different people. We've seen folks who it's really pronounced and folks who it's just like a little arch. Uh, Chris, uh, was his name? Christopher McDaniel, the guy in Macon, Georgia, with the weird little forehead oh, yeah. thing, Scott. So it can be different on different people. And when people cry, yeah. it can look very different. Yeah. Yeah. The Ukrainian-born cinematographer quickly gelled with Baldwin. The people who watched The Daily said that her work was beautiful. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. But it 
admired by everybody who um who worked with her. All right. Here we go. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal, where you, I'm gonna show her, she's standing next to the camera. She's like this, you or me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels, and she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. And I, I draw the gun out, and I find a mark. I draw the gun out, and I find a cut. And what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle. So if you're shooting directly into the camera lens, you're not aiming I'm not right. shooting into the camera lens. I'm shooting just off. Just off. Right. In her direction. I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it, which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit. It was what I was told. I don't know. This was a completely incidental shot, an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think it's, I know you guys are going to cover some of the behaviors in here. I want to cover a couple of the words. And some of the words that are there and some of the words that are missing from this, uh, this monologue here, he uses the, the word urgent. So what's really urgent is blah, blah. It wasn't meant to be fired at that angle. And then later, he's not using her name in the videos that we've seen so far. So we're on video two. We're not hearing the victim's name being mentioned at all which is a strong data point for dissociation from guilt or dissociation, wanting to, to separate yourself from that person uh, in the eyes of the person that's watching. So keep an eye or maybe an ear on that in the coming videos. It, does the name come out? I want you to be listening to see if you hear the name be used in some of the, the videos that are coming up. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, so when you say words, urgent, I think what he's trying to get out, and I, I have two words written down, urgent and incidental, urgent and incidental. On the side of the road, when we did his video, he talked about it being an incidental shooting, and I was like, what the hell does that mean? Well, now I understand what he means. It was just a thing. It was not going to be part of the part of the show. So it was an accidental thing, accidental, incidental shooting, as he referred to it there. You see his baseline come out again. I mean, this guy is we, we've seen him his whole life in front of a camera, so we know his baseline when he's being interviewed is that animated kind of guy, and he's doing that. But he story tells with his whole body. He puts you in the position. He makes you part of the story, and that's who he is. He's just bringing him in. When he says that incidental, I wonder, is that scripted? And the reason it's come up twice is it's something that's in his head. He's been told, hey, this is incidental. It's not. It was not intended to be part of the, of the movie, and something went wrong. I don't know, but it comes up twice, so it, it means something. It's not a word I would typically use all the time, or nor would he. Um, and other than that, the only thing I see in terms of scripted is that he's trying to avoid certain words and get certain words out, like that urgent word that meant something to him. This It's urgent that you know this, I think is what he means by it, not the thing that is urgent. The other thing is I don't see him accessing left. I don't see him doing any of that kind of stuff. Like he's recalling something he's memorized. Um, and then he does it look off to the, he's to the right and pulling, doing that pulling taffy move as he's trying to get approval from the guy. And then his head drops down to the right. And as he says, incidental, his head is shaking. No, as if, you know, futility, you see that in him. But all of his arrows are aligned in the story he's telling, which is kind of interesting. One interesting note is when he talks about these dummy rounds, because I'm going to assume most people that watch us may or may not know a thing about guns, and it's okay for us to talk about this. When he talks about dummy rounds, what he means is a round that looks exactly like a regular round. A round is a combination of a cartridge with powder and a cap and a bullet. And the bullet is the thing that goes out the barrel. Whether you know that or not, some of you are gonna go, yeah, of course, but some of you don't know. And in a blank, there is no bullet at the end. They put these bullets in the chamber, in the little wheel part of the gun, so that folks like me don't look at it and go, well, you're not shooting anybody with that when they're holding it up to the camera. And so they have these dummies, and it's only as good as how well they build those dummies. I don't know what Hollywood standard is. It could have no cap so you can tell from the back. It could have something else. But if it doesn't, you would have to literally take that round out of that gun and shake it around, pick it up to know the weight difference is the only way you'd be able to tell. So 
it's really easy for us to assign blame and say he should have checked. But in the kind of gun we're talking about, you would literally, Chase, you know, you'd have to take this little thumb ramrod and push each round out, turn the wheel, take each round out and check it. And so I can understand why if you're using cosmetic or dummy rounds, he personally would not check it every time. And it, that's you'll hear a lot of people saying that. I'm not taking his side one way or the other, but I will say there's logic to his discussion here. And I think that's an important part of this tab. Scott, what do you have? All right. Uh, again, he's an excellent storyteller. You know, he's in dramatic and, and, and his thing is stories is telling stories through film as they do. So that's why he sets the scene up perfectly. I mean, it's almost like you're there as he's as he describes it. And that's really great. Again, his illustrators are large and that's what helps do that. They're descriptive illustrators. They go along. Part of the definition of illustrators is not just uh, emphasizing specific words or phrases, but building things in boxes. Uh, Chase has a word for it. What's the word you use, Chase? I use body narration. Body narration. Great work. Um, Great job. Yeah. So uh, his, they're really, really descriptive. And people communicate in three ways. They, 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 when you run into a person who's an auditory person, they'll talk about hearing things and the way things sound. It sounds good to me. That sounds good. Those kind of things. You hear a person who's into to, uh, the visual uh, communication, like most people are in movies or people are into movies. They'll, when they talk about things, they'll say, it looked like this. Here's what it looks like to me. That brooch she's wearing uh, looks a little heavy or whatever. And and then you have kinesthetic, which is the person who talks about things, how things feel and everything. So he's a, a, a visual person. That's why he's always making these big um, illustrators describing and actually building pictures of these things, which he, we see he gets more into it here in a few minutes. There's an edit when he said in, in between uh, she's getting me and she's getting me to position the gun. Then there's the edit. And then he says everything is in her direction. So I don't know what they got out there, but there's a complete change of scene there. And if you listen to it, you'll hear it. That's what first got got me paying attention to it. And then when I watch it, he's a little bit forward, then he's all back and everything looks different. And you can hear um, Stephanopoulos say something during that edit, which they've tried to block out, but it came through on the on the other mic or in the room sound. So after he's after he mimes that pulling the gun thing, he says, "What's really urgent is like you guys were saying." He used that the last time we 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 uh, broke his stuff down. He said, "It's urgent that you know, or it's urgent that something." So that must be one of his little words he uses all the time. And then when he says the gun was meant to be fired, wasn't meant to be fired in that angle, he's smiling, and the smile stays at the end of that. I think this is the first little brick in, and we're seeing in his wall of "I didn't do it; it's not my fault." In other words, and I'll bet you a hundred bucks when it comes to the trial, we'll hear that, uh, that that similar phrase, if not the very same thing. How he talks about uh, how he sets that up the very same way. I know I, I'm under the impression that's going to happen. Um, and after the next question, his posture is perfect. Everything straightens up. Oops, and he's he's sitting like this, and he looks he looks pro. He looks like everything. He looks confident and all that. And he says, uh, "I'm holding the gun where she, where she told me to hold it." Again, there's brick two as he starts building this little wall of it, it's not me. It's I was a victim here as well. And I agree with it. It bugs me. He doesn't say her name at, at so far. He hasn't said her name up to this point so far. Um, all right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. Um, that smile comes, and I think we've seen it before in other work of his that we've, we, or, or interviews or roadside stops that we've looked at. That smile comes when he believes somebody else has made a mistake. And I do believe we see it there and we will see it later on. Uh, so I, I totally agree with that. Um, what I would say, it, like you said, uh, Scott, he is a very good mime. Um, I, I know people like it when I break down words, mime from the Latin mimosis to copy. So he's very good at copying stuff and doing what we call illusionary mime, which is to create the illusion of something that's there that isn't actually physical. So he's great at going, hey, you're me. Uh, you know, she's looking at the monitor like this. He's very clear about cocking you know the gun back here and and later on as well so so and, and very definite look as an actor one of the things you need to be able to do especially in film especially in film is hit your mark exactly and time and time again get props get items get your face get your hand exactly where, where the director of photography wants your face and your hands because they're trying to create the most beautiful picture uh possible so you have to be able to do that time and time again so we should 
should expect his mime, his geography of this story to be spot on. And, and we should expect that, that it doesn't change at any point. And I believe it is spot on. I believe we see him describe this very, very, very clearly. And he says with downward intonation, I'm not shooting at the camera lens. Okay. And he's mapped that out as well. He's very clear tonally that, that he isn't shooting at the camera lens and he's already mapped that out for us. And, um, and when he says that as well, his hands are on his knees. There's no adapters. There's no self soothers. So I think, you know, the, the biggest thing I take from this particular, um, piece of footage here is this is what he looks like when he's telling you the truth. Okay, this is what he looks like when he's very, very clear of exactly what happened. And then there's that slight upturn of the mouth there and slight smile of this is what he looks like as well when he thinks somebody else has done something wrong. And he also does start to st set up in his narrative there that the he was under the control or under the orders of the director of photography as well. So he's already started to shift, I think, as, as Chase might say, that kind of locus of control away from him and towards somebody else. So I interesting uh, second film there. That's what I got for you. And Scott, I think to your point, when he when there's the edit there, I think he was asked a present tense question to put him in the present moment because he switches to past tense to present. So I am or she's doing this to me. So those are all present. Okay. So I think the question that Stephanopoulos asked him was something, okay, so you're here and you're doing this. So what's happening now? So a, a question to kind of put him in present and get him to describe mm -hmm. the scene better. I think mm -hmm. that's what was edited out. Yeah. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal where you, I'm going to show her. She's standing next to the camera. She's like this. You or me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels. And she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. And I, I draw the gun out and I find a mark. I draw the gun out and I find a cut. And what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle. So if you're shooting directly into the camera lens, you're not aiming I'm not shooting into the camera lens. I'm shooting just off. Just off. Right, in her direction. I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it, which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit. That was what I was told, I don't know. This was a completely incidental shot, an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. Mm. Yeah. But we kept doing this, and so then I said to her, now in this scene, I'm gonna cock the gun. I said, do you want to see that? And she said, yes. So I take the gun and I start to cock the gun. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. At the moment. The decisive that was moment. the moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger. On day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. All right, Greg, what do you got? So here now I start to see him delivering his story. If you don't believe he has something he wants to get out, whether it's a scripted story or, as you put it, uh, Scott, building a wall, when he hits points he wants to get across, he double states every one of those key points. And if you can look for it when he says things like, I did not point at her, I would not point at her, I did not. Uh, I would never point and pull the trigger. The interesting piece for me, so go back and listen, and you'll hear three different places. Go back and listen to the three different places. He doubles the statement. Never, never. And then he looks away when he's telling his story and when he's showing how he cocked the gun and all those kinds of things. No eye contact at all. When he starts to make real eye contact is when he's talking about, well, my training, boom, 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 and he's pulling his finger like he's firing a trigger. He makes good eye contact. So I think it's important to him to get across the meaning of what 
matters. And then when there's something as throwaway, for example, this, you know, this gun training from his first time that pull the trigger, pull the trigger, pull the trigger, then he makes good eye contact. So interesting, interesting that he's trying to get across content, that he is double telling certain points. And he shows distaste or disdain or something right after that. That was the training I had that kind of half faced draw back the side of the face. Something's going on in his head there. Here's the thing. We can see what's going on. We can't tell you what is causing it. What inside his brain is causing that? It could be something internal. That he's disappointed in himself that he has something to do with that. It could be that he is pissed at Stephanopoulos because he asked him a hard question that he was not ready for. It could be the situation, the entire situation. We can't tell that. We can see the, the symptoms. We can't tell the cause. And that's, we always say, we don't read minds as much as Scott's friends think we're in the mind reading business. We're actually looking for symptoms and we try to figure it out from there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. We're still not seeing a mention of the victim's name, uh, which is a, a data point here, especially during these heated, intense moments. We're not seeing that stuff, but we're seeing a ton of repetition. And as a, as a behavioral expert, if I'm ever talking about brainwashing or this mind control stuff and how to control people's thoughts, if I could sum it all up in one word, it would be repetition. And there is a ton of repetition here. He's saying, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? We got three times. He says, I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. That's twice repeated. And that was the moment the gun went off. Repeated twice again. Trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. You don't pull the trigger. I would never pull the trigger. Then he says, click, 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 click over and over again. So there's tons of repetition here that I have never once in my life of analyzing video and interrogations and uh, all kinds of videos. I've never seen uh, statements like this with this much repetition inside the statement. Typically, uh, when I see lots of repetition, there was probably a bullet list that an attorney provided to that person, or there was a bulletized list with some very, very key data points that need to be hammered down. So the person by default starts to repeat those things. And he's saying, you never point a gun at somebody. The entire point of having guns and movie sets 90% of the time is to point them at somebody and then pull the trigger. So when we say like this weapon safety laws would have stopped everything, maybe not because a lot of times in the movies, that's the purpose of having the gun there. There's gunfights and guns are being pointed at people. There's a lack of emotion throughout this. There's a lack of emotion throughout speaking about the event uh, on the face. And this is scientifically proven in peer reviewed journals all over the world that we have facial expressions that are pretty much universal. And we're not seeing hardly any of that throughout this. And there's a lack of hesitancy here, which is unusual for a person who's just gone through something traumatic. This is their first big TV appearance to talk about everything. We, we would typically see some hesitation here, some stopping to think, which we will see in a future video. But there's, it's very on uh, message here. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, maybe not, I won't say scripted because the whole thing's titled unscripted, but there is, there is some rehearsal. I'll say prepared that. Prepared content. Yeah, yeah prepared <laughs> content. Uh, Mark. Mark. Yeah, so uh, so I agree that repetition of those words, is it PR message? That's a possibility. Is it self-soothing? This is a stress point for him, and so the repetition is around self-soothing. Could be that. Um, is it even maybe that he isn't getting the response that he wants from the interviewer? You know, I, I, I pulled it back, I let it go, and that's when the gun went off. Maybe he was expecting the interviewer to go, oh, that's when the gun went off, right? So you didn't pull the trigger. No, I never pulled the. Oh, so you didn't pull the trigger. I think he might be expecting a, a moment of revelation in the audience and the interviewer, and he doesn't get that back, and so he repeats again. Like this is the moment where you suddenly realise I'm not culpable. This is an accident. I don't know which one of those it is. It possibly, it's all of the above. I'm not quite sure, or some of some of one and some of the other. But but it is interesting. I, um, Greg, I get it as well. The disdain on you don't point a gun at someone and pull the trigger. That's 
for me when I see the disdain. Now, disdain or contempt, it tends to be a social thing. It tends to be that somebody has done something wrong. And just as Greg said, it can be internal or, or, or external. I did something against the group or somebody else did something against the group. So is it that, look, he really should have known not to just half cock and let go of it should have known that and so it's it's disdain against himself or somebody should have checked the gun more thoroughly it's disdain against the other person but ultimately that we see disdain that means a social rule has been broken and he says look first day first day i was taught this so like this is he goes back to his initiation within the group and says this is the thing that you never ever break and somebody somewhere has broken the rules of our group um but again let's just lastly go back to the geography of this we see that the finger is straight he's telling us i don't have my finger uh on the trigger there you know so so the geography makes a lot of sense and he's a good mime and he should be able to reproduce exactly what's going on so so i i buy a lot of what he's saying there i'm interested in the repetition uh just as everybody else is scott what do you got all right. Um, after he, he describes up to the point of the of the discharge, after he talks about all the moments coming up to that, uh, everything changes. He starts talking a little bit quieter. He gets really still, as you would, because you're coming up on something pretty heavy. And then um, at, I mean, we haven't seen that up to this point, obviously. Um, and I think the disdain and stuff you guys are talking about, that contempt— I don't think that's what it is. When you look at Trump, and, and Greg po uh, pointed this out, he does a sniff thing. Every time he makes a point or he scores something, he does this. And it's kind of Barney, Barney Fife-esque is, is the idea I got from that. And I, I did the thing where I slowed down, so I sped it up, slowed down. There is no sniff there, but I think that's what I think that's what that is. That That's what it looks like to me, and that's what we're all about, was it looked like to each one of us. So, right. so I think what we're seeing is him just going, like that i don't think it's it's a uh, um i don't think it's disdain it could be mark because i started thinking about that when you said that because when i first saw it i said oh, that, and amber actually pointed out to me she said look at that and i was like yeah but that, it, it's a tough call on that but i think it's more of of of, of counting things he, he that he's scored on because at that point what, what he's talking about there again is gonna is gonna come up in in his uh, court case again it's a little brick to put up for his wall it's just he's got a pretty good foundation for it so far. All right, that's what I got. You good? Hey, one one quick note. I wondered about that, Scott. The only reason mm -hmm. I didn't think that is because Mark, what you said about him repeating. I wondered if he was insecure as a reason he's repeating, repeating, repeating. And then I thought, well, he he didn't win. He doesn't look like he's winning to me. So I, I had the same thought about the Trump thing. I thought maybe he's just doing something like that. But yeah, he's yeah. he's I, I think he's insecure in this video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough call on that one. But we kept doing this, and it was so then I said to her, now in this scene, I'm going to cock the gun. And I said, do you want to see that? And she said, yes. So I take the gun, and I start to cock the gun. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun, and the gun goes off. I let go of the hammer of the gun, and the gun goes off. At the moment. The that was the moment. moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger. On day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. So you have this Colt 45, you just pulled... The hammer as far back as I could without cocking the actual... And gun. you're holding on to the hammer. I'm holding that. I'm just showing I go, how about that? Does that work? You see that? Do you see that? You see that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer, bang, the gun goes off. Well, everyone is horrified. They're shocked. Uh, it's loud. They don't have their earplugs in. No one was... The gun was supposed to be empty. I was told I was handed an empty gun. If there were cosmetic rounds, nothing with a charge at all, a flash round, nothing. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I, I see a lot of whole body illustration again, and then really over the top, bang. I mean, he looks excited in a way. If I shot someone, I probably would go and then bang, you know, but 
who knows? I mean, he's a storyteller. That's what he does. The only time he makes eye contact and is focused on Stephanopoulos is when he's not giving details. Is that something that he's been coached? Don't know. Is it just instinctive for him not to look him in the eyes when he's talking about something that's this big a deal? I can't tell you that. I can tell you he does not look Stephanopoulos in the eyes when he's working through details. That might mean he's trying to remember something. He's trying to remember the details as tightly and accurately as he can. But he does a lot of downright eye accessing. And I know you know you guys are not on the same play, plate I am exactly about eye movement, but downright eye accessing is about as close to a universal as I go. As I go, Most everybody, when they're thinking about something emotional, is going to go drop down into their right. He does a lot of that. And then you can see he's trying to sync with him. He'll turn his head to him a little, and he's trying to sync with him and get some approval. And then when he's talking about the gun was supposed to be empty, he turns his head to a different location than he's had to now and kind of does that drawing with his eyes for, ex for acceptance. He's doing an oblique angle as he's talking to him. Then he goes downright, as I was told, his illustrators sync, and then his face goes to some kind of confusion or something going on with him when I wondered, did she faint? So there's something going on in his head here. I think he, those are real feelings. And I don't think this is, if he were trying to project powerful emotion, it wouldn't look like that. Confusion would probably not be the emotion he came up with. He would come up with sorrow or grief or something like that. So I don't think that part's scripted. I think he's telling the truth, how he felt, what he saw. And that's what I got. Scott, what do you have? All right. Um, and now he's all worked up and excited real big. So he's um, his cadence speeds up again, and um, his finger, his fake finger gun comes up a little bit higher as well. Now, let me ask you guys this. When you are, when we're explaining something for a sh uh, shooting a gun, do you do this? Or do you do this? Or do you, do, you do this? I do the grip. So, so it would look like that. I do the grip. You know, grip. your yeah. finger would or, be. Or that, yeah. Be, yeah. yeah. So that's really yeah. odd. It doesn't look like he's he. Ha, I don't think he's around as many guns as, as he's coming on like he is. I don't think he's from he's he's familiar with actually going out and shooting them. So good or bad, yeah. uh, maybe I don't just know, on that. set. And it, we don't think of a gun as something for a set. We're thinking about bracing because of impact and shooting yeah. is part of the reason why. Yeah. So he starts talking even faster, and then uh, when he, especially when he says, "I was told I was handed an empty gun." That's speeding up there. I can that that's understandable because he's excited about this at this point. Then he said, "She goes down." I thought to myself, "Did she faint?" Let me ask you something. If we're in a room, and you hear a gunshot, and you see somebody on the floor, two people, one guy screaming, and one girl on the floor, a woman on the floor. Are you going to say, "I wonder if she fainted"? No. You're not gonna. You're not gonna wonder if she fainted. You're gonna know exactly what happened. You're gonna know exactly what happened at that point. So this is where he starts getting a little bit on my um, on my nerves with when he starts down this road. And I'll leave it there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, on on that exact exact moment, Scott, I get an asymmetrical turn up of the mouth. It's not enough for me to go. That's that's Jupiter's delight. I don't think it's that. It's not enough for me to go. It's disgust or disdain. But something is odd about that. It doesn't. Something's odd about that. That moment. Um, yeah, I agree. If 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 a if a if you know uh, there's a bang, there's a gun, and there's a bang, and somebody falls over, the first thing I would worry is something's loaded. Somebody's been shot. That's not somebody fainting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, look, um, look how clear he is about bang. Uh, the gun goes off and he does this strike, this out gesture, you're out gesture. Uh, so really, really emphatic at that point. Again, this is the body language of a storyteller, uh, a good mime who's telling you exactly what went on. Uh, no doubts about it on that. Then very interesting for me, later on, he does this lean forward and side into the into the face. It might be that side on the camera, I can't remember. But essentially, he's doing the mime of just talking into the interviewer's ear, because he wants to they, then say something quite intimate to him. It's this idea of let me tell you something just between you and me. The, the gun was supposed to be empty. The gun was supposed to be empty. And then we see what I talked about before that what I would call that righteous smile from him of look, this is between you and me. This is somebody else's fault. I'm not culpable on this. Now, look, you know, eventually, 
uh, courts will will decide decide that. But ultimately, I think you know he has a, a very fixed idea at the moment that uh, somebody else is culpable, and and you know between you and me, he should he should let he should let people know that little bit secretly, little bit covertly, just so we all know. Let's not shout it out loud. But let's just say it quietly. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Are we all done? Chase? Our <laughs> <laughs> regulators there, yeah. <laughs> all right. Let, let me go again. Uh, Jace, I'm gonna keep, I'm keep what do you got? Yeah, of course you are. Of course you are. But I, I want people to see. I want people to see how it could have been. You know how it could have been. I want them to see just how it. This, this, okay. this, this, this panelist is what a great handover looks like. Okay, and, and that's all I've got on that one. Chase, Scott should have done. What it do you got? Oh, you talked over my handover. You know I'm gonna have to do. Everybody it looks again. serious. Everybody no, looks like we're no, really you're all talking it. over my handover. Quiet, please. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. Okay. And that's all I've got on that one. Chase, what do you got? Thanks for being so professional, Mark. Let Thank me you. Start off by saying there's more repetition here. There's more repetition just like last time, and there's more repetition here, if you didn't see that yet. Uh, but I want you to think just of the person we're looking at, not as a normal person. This is almost an outlier type of person which is when we typically see outlier behaviors. But one of the things we're hearing in the beginning of this is him telling us this almost like he's reading a screenplay. And please keep in mind, this guy probably reads screenplays for a living. He probably gets 50 of them shipped to his house every day. But he's saying everyone's horrified. They are shocked. It is loud. They don't have their earplugs. This is straight out of third person POV from fiction. This is straight third person POV out of a screenplay. So, again, we're not hearing a name. We're not hearing the name of the actual victim here. And when he talks about her going down, there's just this simple jerk of the hand. It's really abrupt. There's not a whole lot of emotion uh right here. And I think a person like this might not be communicating the emotion because we're not at the emotional part of the screenplay. We're not at the emotional part of the story yet. And I'm not saying that that's a deceptive behavior. I'm saying this is how this person's psychology most likely works. I'm willing to bet that he is honest and this is a truthful recollection uh, for the most part uh, that we're seeing here. That's all I got. So you have this cold 45, you just pulled the hammer as far back as I could without cocking the actual. And you're gun. holding on to the hammer. I'm holding that. I'm just showing. I go, how about that? Does that work? You see that? Do you see that? Is that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang, the gun goes. Well, everyone is horrified. They're shocked. Uh, it's loud. They don't have their earplugs in. No one was. The gun was supposed to be empty. I was told I was handed an empty gun. If there were cosmetic rounds, nothing with a charge at all, a flash round, nothing. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? All right. Good. Within 15 minutes or 20 minutes after that, the police arrived and took the church set and put the crime tape around it, the yellow tape, and forced us all to the perimeters of the parking area where we sat and waited. She was in the church, and she was not taken out of the church for quite a while. In the aftermath, there was chaos and confusion. But nobody told you what happened? No, no. Did it, you was, know it wasn't until I was in the police station. Hours later, I mean, it was like seeing aliens. It was, it, was, it was utter disbelief over the idea. It was unacceptable, the idea that it was a live round. And finally, one of the police officers at the conclusion of my interview, I was there for like an hour and a half or so, she takes her phone and she slides it across to me. She says, that's what came out of Joel's shoulder, a 45 caliber slug. It was a real bullet. Had you known that Joel had been hit? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer, said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. And then the kind of insanity-inducing agony of thinking that someone put a live bullet in the gun. I'll go first on this one. Um, again, really large 
illustrator setting up the scene. And we and when he scratches his head, that's that's ventilation. A lot of times you see somebody who is who is wondering about stuff, or they're getting heated up about something. They're getting worried. You'll see him do that. He's got some hair, so he does that. But at the same time, it could be him scratching his head and just sort of pushing on, almost as an adapter, or almost like he's not unsure of what of of what's happening there or what he's saying. Um, and when he says, "But nobody told you, told you," when the interviewer says, "Nobody told you what happened," no, that's really fast and really loud. And it wasn't until I was at the police station hours later. That he knew some that that he knew anything like that happened. Um, if I had heard somebody get shot again, and there's a woman laying on the floor, and there's a guy laying back there screaming because he's been shot in the shoulder, you're gonna know what happened. This is starting to sound like this. This is starting to sound deceptive because what he does, is he moves himself away from. So you didn't know the other guy got hit. He doesn't say no, no, I didn't. He he keeps talking. I didn't we didn't know this until the uh police officer did this so you know hours later or whatever however long ago it was later this this to me is these are bells and whistles right here uh, he's being really careful about what, he, what he's saying this is not un, it may be unscripted but he had the answers of the questions given to him earlier because he's ready for that as he goes through and this guy isn't coming on hard with there's nothing no reason for him to come on, you know, tough with him because we know he didn't do it on purpose, or it's, I would assume he didn't do it on purpose. That seems obvious, but um, but that's that's deceptive behavior right there. That's what puts him in that category of lookout and and that thing. Um, let's. I'll stop there. I know I'm, I'm I'm humming around the same thing every time, but man, this this looks this looks deceptive to me. All right, Chase, what do you got? There is a huge chunk of missing information here. We already know from his appearance uh, when the media stopped him on the side of the road, he, he's comfortable saying what he can't talk about and what he can. He is. We've already established his comfort level with telling the media that he can't talk about some, something, but there's still something missing. If you shoot a person and 15 minutes goes by before police force you out of a building, no one needs to tell you what happened. If you're in the room long enough for 911 to be called, you know what happened. If you shoot someone and they bleed, you know what happened. The, the narrative here seems to be that he just vanished from the building immediately after the gun went off. And people on the scene who he was sequestered with would have seen the bullet holes, would have seen some kind of wound. Uh, so this is we're, we're, we're at the point of criticizing story and not necessarily behavior here. But this is this is all what we do. You know, we're interrogators. We, we talk to people for a living. This would be a gigantic missing black hole in the story where everything's falling apart. Uh, but obviously, I think this was an accident. And once we get to our final thoughts, I think you're going to be surprised a little bit. But uh uh, that's all I got. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, pretty simply, um, there are a couple of things. If you shoot somebody tomorrow, there's going to be all kinds of things go through your head. You're going to hedge. And if you're in this situation where you happen to be a producer and you happen to be the actor who pulled the trigger and, 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 you're going to have some stone walls around things that you should and shouldn't talk about. So, of course, we're going to see deceptive body language. We're going to see him trying. Remember, deception doesn't mean lying. It can sometimes mean omitting information. And you're dancing around the topic when somebody gets close to it. And I think we're seeing some of that. Uh, Scott, I think when he does this, it's more than a simple comforter. When people feel high stress, often you'll see them grip and rub the back of their head. And I think when he puts his hand up there, that's pretty damn pronounced. For all the rest of his body language, that's pretty damn pronounced. I think he realizes we're getting awfully close to some of those areas. I need to be careful. And that's what I think we're seeing is when he starts to repeat, it's because he's uncertain. We're not seeing a whole lot of that. He is going down right. He's navigating whatever's going on. His eyes widen at it was a real bullet. That actually, I think, is real for him. I don't think his eyes intentionally did it. I think that's an autonomic response to what his brain is doing. If somebody met, scripted this message for him, he needs to hire somebody else because nobody says no one had any idea until. I think that's his brain trying to craft the sentence to say, we didn't know what really happened. But Chase, I'm with you. If you shoot somebody tomorrow with a 45 long Colt at five to 10 feet away, 
you know what happened. You certainly yeah. know. Anything that's lethal is going to, the cavitation from that round is going to make a hell of a mess out of a person. And you, you won't be able to forget it when that happens. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have all that in his head and all those visuals, but has been told, shut up. Don't say a word. Don't know. I'm, I'm just saying if he were in that situation, right. if my friend were in that situation and said, hey, this happened, I'd say, don't talk at all about details about what you know. Just be quiet. And I'm sure his lawyers have already said it. He also says when he says no one had any idea until that's blame sharing. So he feels some responsibility, certainly, whether, you know, whether he should or not, that's a different equation. I think anybody who shoots somebody is going to feel that. And I think as we get to that blame sharing, we're starting to use team pronouns, as you would call them, Chase. I always just call it blame sharing when it's me that pulled the trigger. I want other people involved. No one had any idea until. I think he's working and navigating through here. And that's what you're seeing is, is deception, I think. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. For somebody who is so good at using the descriptors and using the mime to tell us the story and tells a good verbal story, we've got the gap in the story now. We do get some really good geography of, look, the tape went around the church. So really good geography, really good mime of that. But where is the mime of, you know, and then, you know, Hutchins falls to the floor. I run over. I'm doing this. Um, You, you know, uh, Somebody over there is grabbing there. There's nothing of that description. Yeah, I, I'm with everybody else. Why? Why are we not talking about that? Why? Why don't we get some good storytelling uh, around that? Um, and I think yeah, everybody could be right there around. Well, that's the one thing you're not going to hear about because culpability, or not acting quick enough, or not taking control, not being a good leader in that situation may well come up. I just don't know. I'm speculating, of course, around that. Uh, what What is most interesting for me is how he does transference of power um, into objects. Uh, and I think it might be a little bit of a, a redirect there, Greg, a, a little bit of, of, of chaff and redirect in that he goes, he picks up this book and don't you as an audience go, what's he picking up? What's he doing? What's he doing? He goes, well, this is an iPhone. All right, you've just made a book into an iPhone. And what it what it is, is the representation of a bullet because because, you know, she had the bullet on it and then he puts it down on the table and he kind of puts it a cursory slides it over cursory slides it over. I think what he's doing there, number one is a bit of a redirect of look at my storytelling, look at my mime, because it is quite extraordinary. And then he's he's showing how the police blindside him and are cursory about it. So there's a bit of blame shift there, or certainly a bit of, you know, look, negative pe people doing negative things over here. Don't look over here, look over here. Um, so extraordinary, and again, control elsewhere. All the control is, I knew nothing about this. I was blindsided by this book being an iPad, being a bullet, um, you know, quite, again, quite extraordinary and and missing data there there that's what i got on that one nice uh, sorry within 15 minutes or 20 minutes after that the police arrived and took the church set and put the crime tape around it the yellow tape and forced us all to the perimeters of the parking area where we sat and waited she was in the church and she was not taken out of the church for quite a while in the aftermath there was chaos and confusion but nobody told you what happened no, no. Did it, you was, know? it wasn't until I was in the police station. Hours later, I mean, it was like seeing aliens. It was, it was utter disbelief over the idea. It was unacceptable, the idea that it was a live round. And finally, one of the police officers, at the conclusion of my interview, I was there for like an hour and a half or so, she takes her phone and she slides it across to me. She says, that's what came out of Joel's shoulder, a forty-five caliber slug. It was a real bullet. Had you known that Joel had been hit? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. And then the kind of insanity inducing agony of thinking that someone put a live bullet in the gun. All right, let's go to the next one. The notion that there was a live round in that gun did not 
dawn on me till probably 45 minutes to an hour later. 45 minutes to an hour? Well, she's laying there and I go, did she get hit by wadding? Was there a blank, sometimes those blank rounds have a wadding inside that packs, it's like, like a cloth that packs the gunpowder in. Sometimes wadding comes out and can hit people and it can feel like a little bit of a poke. But no one could understand, did she have a heart attack? Because remember, the idea that someone put a live bullet in the gun was not even in reality. Did you go up to her? Did you back away? I went away? up to her, and then we were immediately we were told to get out of the building. We were forced to get out of the building. The medics came in. I mean, I stood over her for 60 seconds, and she just lay there kind of in shock. Was she conscious? Uh, my recollection is yes. All right, Greg, what do you got? So this is the only time we see him change dramatically from his baseline. He's got this passionate, over-enunciated kind of New Yorker thing going on, and suddenly he goes, ah, uh, um, and stammers. He now is in trouble. This is a place where he's been told something, I guarantee you. I mean, I, there's rarely a time you hear me say, this is a fact. This I would almost guarantee is a fact. He has eye accessing to his left pretty hard, which you would say three o'clock. I typically associate with something I'm recalling I've heard. And he goes, my recollection is yes. Well, there's distancing from the answer. His blink rate actually increases here. And he does a short nervous nod. It's an odd out of everything that we see. It's out of baseline. And I think it's a danger zone for him. Somebody has told him to be very careful, not to be passionate around this, not to talk about it. And then you also see a little disapproval or sadness as the sides of his mouth draw down. It's out of out of standard. So this is a place I think he's been coached and the coaching is actually showing. Um, Scott, what do you got? Or Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I to totally agree. We get a nose a nose wrinkle from him, very slight on when he talks about 60 seconds. So again, I'm concerned about that 60 seconds. I'm like, how accurate is that? I'm concerned now. The story is getting fuzzy for me a little bit. It seems to get, be getting fuzzy for him. It's getting fuzzy for me. I'm not seeing the same mime happening. I'm not seeing the same emphatic use of, of detail. Just as you said there, Greg, conscious, uh, my recollection, that's out of baseline. I totally uh, agree. Um, you know, so, he, so, however, look, is it that, um, you know, my expectation is when a gun goes off, when there's a loud bang, you know, and, and all hell breaks loose, you can forget things. We all know that when, that when, you know, you're fuzzy on the detail, you know, before you might remember, but after that gun goes off, maybe it gets a bit fuzzy. So we don't want to discount that. But for somebody who is so, so accurate and detailed, uh, this is off baseline for me. Scott, what do you think of that one? All right. Um, you're right about that that nose part when in during the 60 seconds, something's up there because mm -hmm. we get a full on, and I think you blinked, Mark, halfway through that because it isn't just a little wrinkle. It's a full on anger micro expression. I'll, I'll oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I was going through uh, frame by frame, and I'll show it to you. It is unbelievable when you see huh. it. If you if you didn't catch it before, you're gonna you're gonna go. Oh my god, that's unbelievable. When he says no one could understand, did she have a heart attack? None of this, none of this sounds like it went down the way it supposedly went down. Um, we were forced. We were forced out of the building. And he said he stood over over for sixty seconds. Then they were forced out of the building. Right. Well, keep in mind. He's the guy in charge. It's his movie. He's the star. He's a producer. And with an attitude, with an ego like that, you think he's going to let somebody force us out of the building? No, he'd want to stay. And how long does he say it takes for the cops to get there and the ambulance to get there? 15, 20 minutes. So he wasn't sitting there for, for 60 seconds over. I bet he said something. Something went squirmy in there on him. Something happened in there because he's angry about whatever it was. So I think that's why there's something up there. It'll come out in, in hopefully in court. But that's my opinion. Doesn't mean it actually did. I could completely be wrong. But I think something happened in there and he's trying to push away from that. Um, and because he looks braced and he's a, and defensive during this as well. Um, another thing when he says, I stood, oh yeah, I stood there for 60 seconds. Um, I'll go back to my thing where I, I won't go on. You covered, you guys covered a lot of that. I think there's something up in that 60 seconds there. I don't think that went down the way he said it went down. And I, I think there's something goofy in there. I think we'll see that later on. Chase, what do you got? Uh, the bullets that were in this gun. It, it, if you're not familiar with a lot of guns, they're called the 45 Long Colt. It's a 45 caliber bullet. It's about that long. It's about as big around as my pinky. 
And if you're standing over a person with a hole in them this size, uh, there is going to be blood. There's going to be uh, pain. There's going to be probably a loss of consciousness to some degree, uh, no matter where the bullet hole is. And especially if you do it for 60 seconds, maybe longer. Uh, and suddenly the only thing that he needs to qualify or what we call an exclusion statement when, when we hear politicians all the time say, to the best of my knowledge, as I recall, to my recollection, those kind of exclusion statements uh, is her level of consciousness. It's the only time we hear an exclusion used throughout this entire thing is due to her level of consciousness here uh, after the incident happened, which I think is a, a, a big red flag. And this is after he's saying they were immediately forced out of the building. And this comment about her being conscious, I think, is a huge baseline deviation for Baldwin to begin with. His eyes are recalling standing over her at nine o'clock to his to our nine o'clock a couple of times. And was she conscious? We hear the interviewer ask and he says only. Um, and we hear this long um, the only time that he uses these kind of filler words there. And the only qualifier, there's no eye movement during the recall for the question. There is a complete body freeze during the initial processing as he starts to answer. And there is a nod for agreement as he's saying uh, to my recollection. He's He is getting it, trying to get a nod from the interviewer. And I would say this it's probably an accident. This is likely deceptive or it's likely concealing uh, based on something he's heard from legal counsel. That's all I got. Yeah, guys, a couple of things to think about. Remember the first time you ever fired a firearm without earplugs? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Holy, I mean, you're back on your, especially this gun. That's a lot of powder coming out, mm -hmm. all the stuff that's going to go, <laughs> the impact to this person, the sounds, the smells, the, all that stuff that if you've never been around firearms and if you've never been around someone shot, all that stuff together, it creates this whirl of things going on around you that I can understand how you can't remember facts. And anybody told me 60 seconds, I'd go, yeah, it probably isn't that, even if they're being truthful with me, because your brain goes into a different gear when that kind of stuff yeah. happens. Just that sound alone is enough. But then you're right, this person is going to be screaming that person's going to be screaming. You may not hear it. They may be in and out. Of, there's all kinds of stuff going on. That somebody we're not in the, any of that is like and somebody in that group. Somebody would have said somebody out of all the people in that room would have said, "Oh my God, she's been shot." Or do you think she could have been shot? You or shot said her. to him, you, "Did you, you shoot her?" her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or when you step outside, when somebody gets shot and the idea doesn't pop into his head, come on, man. Well, when they call nine one one, when they call nine one one, they said someone has been shot. Yeah. Was it a real bullet? It was a, you know, you can listen to the 911 call. You can play it over here, Scott, because they, yeah. they mention it. I think we're all on the same page. There, anything he's hiding here, I think he's hiding out of protection, not yeah. in his, you know, his hedging because of that. First time I ever shot a gun and, and I didn't have earplugs in, I didn't hear anything. All I heard was this. I went, <laughs> yeah, I heard exactly. it was a whistle. <laughs> Yeah. It scared me to death. I was like, you know, I was like, oh. you, ever, you ever shot a gun in a car? You ever shot a gun in a car? No. Holy no, no, man. No. The first time you do that, it doesn't matter if you have hearing protection in. Well, after I did loud. it, my brother's like, everybody, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. it was weird. The notion that there was a live round in that gun did not dawn on me till probably 45 minutes to an hour later. 45 minutes to an hour? Well, she's laying there and I go, did she get hit by wadding? Was there a the blank, sometimes those blank rounds have a wadding inside that packs, it's like, like a cloth that packs the gunpowder in. Sometimes wadding comes out and can hit people and it can feel like a little bit of a poke. But no one could understand, did she have a heart attack? Because remember, the idea that someone put a live bullet in the gun was not even in reality. Did you go up to her? Did you back I went away? up to her and then we were immediately we were told to get out of the building. We were forced to get out of the building. The medics came in. I mean, I stood over her for 60 seconds and she just lay there kind of in shock. Was she conscious? Uh, my recollection is yes. We, we've all seen that picture of you off the set 
in that hour or so after the gun went off, what were you doing? What was going through your mind? At the end of, she was laying there and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody, just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was going to be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was? At the very end of my interview with the sheriff's department, they said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it, she died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so the question there is, what was going through your mind? Pretty clear question. What was going through your mind? And um, Chaffin redirect, I think. Blame shift as well. Um, it's amazing how long they didn't get her into a car. Seemed like a very long time. So who are they? Like, can we know who, who they are? who they are, where were you when when they were doing this thing that you seem to have no control over? So I'm, I'm, I'm confused about that and you're not answering the question. And when you do get to um, an idea of, of, of something that goes through somebody's mind, it's you disbelieve, not I was in disbelief. You disbelieve, not I felt disbelief. So he's, he doesn't at any point take um, ownership of any feeling or emotion or state of mind or mindset uh, and doesn't answer the question, what was going through your mind? And that is interesting, I think, that he wants to avoid that. Chase, what do you think on that one? Right as the question is asked at the beginning, there is lip retraction. And when somebody pulls their lips into their mouth, once it passes the barrier of the teeth, just kind of goes into the teeth. Most of the time that suggests that there is a need for reassurance. And we see that as the question is being asked. And then he says that we're glued to this process, this thing that's happening, which I think is an unusual way of saying we were terrified, worried, scared in anguish or agony or panic and then just, Mark, just like you said, completely agree, shifts the, all the pronouns to you for a short period uh, to, I think, A, subconsciously, we say this to get other people to agree with us. But I think, B, we're doing this to get this agreement away from myself. Everybody else agrees to this. Everybody can, everybody can get on board with this idea. I think it's important here that we note there's not a lot of emotion. There's no behavior of emotion on the face. This is proven science. And you can take a look at that. But there's no discussion. It, it sounds of, like you're describing oh. Greg. <laughs> 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 Sorry, dude. I was looking at it while you're doing that. It's just, it's, I'm just listening. That yeah. depends on what you ask Greg about. That's true. That's true. Sorry, if man. I'm asking Greg about a time he accidentally hurt somebody really bad. Oh, yeah you're going to see emotion, even if it was 15 years ago. Yep. Unless he did it on purpose, which he was paid to do. But uh, wrapping this up, th there's no discussion of feeling or how he reacted or how he felt about any of these events, which I think is stunning to me, especially being such a good storyteller, a, a wonderful actor, knowing what a good story structure looks like, reading all of these screenplays all the time through his life. This is how you snag somebody's focus and attention. This is how you capture their emotion. And this is how you lead it down a certain path. I'm surprised it wasn't here. And I think that there may have been a attorney some kind of attorney or legal counsel saying you, you will not speak about any of these things. Don't talk about feeling bad or don't talk about feeling guilty. Like you look on the back of your insurance card. It says that don't admit any fault. If you get into any accident at any time, 
let us handle that stuff. And that's probably, he heard probably an advanced version of the back of your insurance card. Scott, what'd you think? Yeah, this, again, this, this whole thing looks squirrely to me. I think he's, he's, he's watching what he says. He wants to come out and say something. Obviously from a societal point of view, he sort of has to do something. So this is perfect for that. We all expect it. And I think coming into that, when we're seeing that, that uh, lip compression, I think that might've been from something else because it's, it's already going when he shows up. So maybe he was asking him something at that, at, at that point. So that's cause I looked at that too. And I thought, I don't know what's going on there. So that, that bugged me a little bit. So I think that might be what was going on something beforehand. But still, it, it coincides with what's being asked. So, shoot, you never move something like that who's asking. Anyway, everything, I mean, he's, in this one, this is one of the only times we see an adapter when he squeezes his knee. Uh, he's sitting that he's sitting in his chair like this, and it, it, he's all, you know, straight, very still. I, I don't know. This whole, the, all the, you guys have covered this. I'm not going to go back over and make it boring. This is, this doesn't sound the way it should. To me, and, and that's why I'm not focusing on all the body language right now. I'm going back in interrogator mode because I'd be asking so many questions at this point. Greg, what do you think? Well, first of all, the guy is the producer for the show. He has a legal obligation. All the insurance, all of that stuff is tied to the producers, not the director. The director's about the artistic piece. The producer's the business piece. So if you bring in a guy and you start asking him questions about what he felt, and let's assume for a minute he has feelings that 911 was too slow, that she died because the helicopter took forever, and he talks about that, or that somebody else caused a problem, and, and, and. He can't say that. I mean, the guy is held up to a standard that anybody else on the set would get away with saying something. It's kind of like if you're corporate America and you're in the, in the leadership team, other people can say, yeah, well, we caused that. You can't. And you get in positions where you have to hold back information. I think that's the lip compression. I think when he first starts with lip compression and then when he's feeling a struggle, I think, Chase, that's when you see him retract his lips because he's looking for approval that, hey, I'm not going to be able to tell you this. His head drops down and to the right and he starts to adapt. This is the first time we've seen that. And I think what they're asking him to do is to, you know, air dirty laundry, to shine a bright light on his own ugly baby. And he really can't do that today because he's held in a position of, of, of an insurance He's a guarantor for that insurance, all that kind of stuff that he's tied to that the rest of the cast may or may not be. I also see his right hand illustrating as he's down right eye access and he's talking. I see a slight sneer, a slight sneer, contempt at how long it took that helicopter to get out of there. That's why I think he's hiding a whole lot of something. We won't be able to tell that. But he does a deep draw in of a breath and he pulls his lips in a deep swallow and moves his eyes down right i think what we're seeing here is containment and him not being able to say things that he's been coached to stay away from and feeling contempt for somebody now who it is don't know don't know all the details i can just see containment that's it we, we've all seen that picture of you off the set in that hour or so after the gun went off what were you doing what was going through your mind at the end of, she was laying there, and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody, just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was going to be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was? At the very end of my interview with the sheriff's department, they said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it, she died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. All right. Well, let's throw around the room and let's everybody give 30 seconds or less on, uh, or a minute or less on what we think was going on uh, and our thoughts on this group of videos. Mark, we'll start with you, go to Chase, and then Greg, and I'll wrap it up. Yeah, so I think just as you were saying there, Greg, there's there's liabilities there, there's culpabilities there as well. So I think some information, look, I, I think it comes across to me that it's well acted out that there was a real accident that happened here. I think after that moment, the story becomes very, very 
fuzzy. I think it could be that fuzzy story is a, is about culpability and liability and certain details being held back about that. One other option is that does he feel he handled himself and his team in a way that would be respected by other people? It's interesting for me that he that he is um, for want of a better word, triggered uh, at the start of this interview by the word admired. She was admired. Did he act in an admirable way during this? I think that might be uh, an issue. Complete conjecture, though, based on all this information that, that has come together and ideas that I have in my own little head. Chase, what do you think? I think we're seeing a person who is mostly honest and deliberately concealing. And I think the deception that we're seeing here is not admitting to concealing that information deliberately. That might, that might've been kind of a Rumsfeld uh, known unknowns, but uh, I, I think there's some hidden information that's deliberate and we're expecting for him to say, just like we've seen in past videos, I can't talk about that. I don't want to talk about that right now, or I don't want to answer X, Y, Z question. And I think saying things like that will be hard to do on a show that's literally titled unscripted. Uh, it would probably just be difficult. I think it was an accident. Uh, I think he feels bad about it. I think talking about how bad he feels uh, would hurt him in court or has the potential to hurt him in court. Greg? Yeah, the first thing I would say is, this is a person who has taken the life of someone accidentally. I know none of us think he put a round in the, in the chamber and went and shot this lady. So just for a second, if you've ever hit a dog or a deer or any animal on the highway, think about how emotionally messed up you were for a short period of time. Most of us that are balanced, you, something went through your head and there were millions of thoughts and trying to figure out what that meant. And I took something's life. Now, compound that by a million times when it's a human being and someone you know, not not someone who's trying to kill you, someone you know. So there's going to be all kinds of stuff going on in this guy's head, and it will go on for a long time. If you think that grief is compound, imagine grief at something that you caused. So this creates a whole new – he's going to have tons of guilt messaging and emblems and that kind of thing just because of that part, number one. Number two, he is a public person who has to do something. This, he, he feels like he has to do something. That'll probably come back to haunt him when he goes to civil or whatever kind of court case this turns into. But he feels like he has to do something. He has to get a message out. Guarantee you that there are things that he's not allowed to talk about by contractual obligation. And then there's some that his attorney has said, don't talk about. So we're seeing when people may say he looks deceptive or that, of course, he's trying to hide something. And some of that may simply be feelings of guilt and inadequacy and, 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 and. But I see mostly an honest guy who's telling you what he remembers. He brought certain things scripted and he's hiding certain things to prevent telling you something that will cause harm to his contractual obligation in the future or to his family and, and, and. Scott, what do you got? I think this whole thing was to build his wall of it, it's not my fault. Is it, It's not my fault wall. I think everything in this says that. From everything we didn't even show in here, all he's doing is building these bricks of it's not my fault. It, from... The, even the, the the woman that he shot, he says, she told me to point it at her. She told me to do this. All those things. He's building this little wall of it's not my fault. And I think you're right, Greg. I never thought about that helicopter situation before. He's calling on everybody. So I think that's that's what this is. And I think it was it was a goal. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're the ones that said, hey, here's what we want to do. We want to come out and his publicist or, his, or whoever it was and said, let's do this. I don't think... Stephanopoulos came to him and said, can we do an interview? I think he showed up with it, if with the offer, I, I would think, because that's all this is, is that his, I didn't do it, or I, um, it was an accident wall. It's not my fault wall, in other words. My favorite is the, what are you doing upstaging me, moved by Alec Baldwin, more than one time, it was she steps in Excuse me? We were a very, very, excuse me, I believe the excuse me is don't upstage me. This is an actor and somebody walking in front of him on the camera. Very, excuse me. But there are a couple of things that I think you can see are going on here. My assumption based on what I see is that yes, they've been followed by these 
reporters. And yes, they're getting frustrated. And I'll bet there's a bunch of going on in the car right now over that very thing. Look what we've gotten into and they're bickering and going back and forth because you can sense some stress between the two of them as they get out. You can't miss it. They, they literally take their mark at the start of the mark is the little cross on the on the ground uh, where you stand because you know you're going to be in the right place for the camera and so yes i think some of it is 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 his push away of of uh, is it is it Hilar hilaria Hila something her birth name isn't even hilaria it's all american hillary but anyway um i think part of the push away is is number one you know don't crowd my lines and don't crowd my my space i've got this handled i think alec turns to face hilaria it's all american hillary alec turns to face her with shoulders and feet pointed at her which i think indicates a little aggression territory and intent and i think there's a possibility that it might not be don't steal the spotlight but don't embarrass me uh, because he has a clear narrative that he's trying to do and she's clearly doing the opposite of what he's trying to do and, and be friendly and show some candor we're seeing everything that shows he's he's in a panic and he's worried it's almost like somebody's jumped out of the car and said all right man let's uh, like he's gonna fight him he's gonna fight somebody because he's in panic mode his, his respiration is up he's talking really loud he's looking back and forth his eyes are wide and they're all baggy you can tell you and slept a whole lot he's tired i'm sure and then he's got his wife out there running around with a camera and he's telling her excuse me excuse me when she gets close to him wow excuse me and when he starts talking about the an act he can't talk about an active investigation i think he's 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 doesn't want to talk about how much trouble he's in i'm not allowed to make any comments so what do you got